In previous lectures, all these years, I've been talking about consciousness only on the surface, uh, superficially, in bits and pieces here and there, so that we have an understanding of what the senses, when the senses, when our sensory organs interact with environments, with the outside world, what's the relationship uh, that arises uh, that arises from such an interaction. So I've been talking just superficially. I plan to do it in detail. Consciousness, this consciousness only school. I plan to do it in detail because that's a very important understanding. I get in more and more detail. As I get in more and more detail, those who don't have basic understanding of consciousness may find it very boring because there's quite a bit of terminology to understand. Uh, but I think that we're already at a higher level. Uh, if we are always repeating the same uh, elementary level, we would not get too much of an ad advancement. So I plan to do a little deeper into it so that we understand what, what enlightenment is all about. We all, we all understand um, universal truth and we all understand um, what the Buddha is actually talking about when he wants us to arrive at Nirvana. What exactly that, what does that mean? Uh, so I would venture more into it and if those who listen to me are interested in understanding life more, universal truth and the actual understanding of Buddhism you should be interested in it. The Buddha was born 2,600 years ago in India. And his mission is to bring uh, Buddhism to the world. Uh, the Buddha in previous many, many lives had been studying, practicing Buddhism for many, many lives. And 2,600 years ago, the last life, uh, of the transformed body, uh, the last life, he introduced Buddhism to the world so that we can learn about it. Um, when he introduced Buddhism, it's one universal understanding of Buddhism. There's no such thing as different schools of Buddhism. And later, later philosophers who follow the practice develop it into different schools uh, what's the reason for doing that is different people have different karma and different abilities of understanding inherent knowledge and different education. So philosophers later develop into schools of thoughts of Buddhism so that there are so many roles that you can take. There's not just one role. It's just like coming to coming to this place called Richmond, there's only not, not just one role coming to Richmond, there's various roles. Depends on where you live, depends on where you start. So later they develop into schools. And to learn Buddhism, you really need to know what are those schools that people have been talking about so that you can classify them, categorize them. When people, when pe when some people uh, are talking about Zen, about meditation, about Chan, then you know, oh, that's Zen Buddhism. When some people are talking about Pure Land, oh, you know that is chanting of Amitabha Buddha. When some people are talking about esoteric Tibetan Buddhism, you know that's the esoteric Buddhism. Oh, or when some people talk about the Tin Tai sect, which is the Lotus Sutra, you know that's what it's talking about. Since 2,600 years ago, later philosophers have spent thousands, two thousand years studying Buddhism and has accumulated a lot of wisdom and understanding in the canons of Buddhism, in the literature of Buddhism. And why don't we just open that treasure box, treasure, not just a box, a whole treasure of, the, a whole valley of treasures, open that door 
and see what it is all about. The more we know about Buddhism, the more we know that people, our ancestors, have been studying Buddhism and transform their consciousness into actual wisdom and attain nirvana. We are, we are still in reincarnation. But all these ancestors, some of these ancestors, they already have entered into nirvana, which is out from suffering, out from reincarnation. Unless you're not touched by what our ancestors do, should you learn something about this? What our ancestors have been striving towards enlightenment. Not just every day doing the same thing of, you know, working, eating, playing, enjoying yourself, and, up to, and afterwards, Everybody is awaiting for that word, death. Yeah, it, it seems that when we, the final destination of humans is death. But before dying, we recreate all, all sorts of karma just to create temporary happiness. And we call that happiness. And in the process of creating temporary happiness, we create a lot of sufferings and karmic energy that lead us into the next round of reincarnation. Uh, yesterday I was uh, trying to take a look more at YouTube on uh, reincarnations and I ran into this case uh, you can get into YouTube the case of yesterday's children there was this lady uh, is, her name is, is on YouTube uh, Jenny Cockwell I think and uh, she has a six student in her previous life in, uh, in a place called Malahide, in a place called Malahide. I don't know where Malahide is. And uh, she was the mother of six children, or five ch children, and in a home where the father uh, of the children was abusive, abused not only the children, but also, also her, the mom. And uh, she really loved her children. And, um, given all tenderly mother love, motherly love, and then she passed away at 32, leaving the, the six children behind. And at the juncture of death, she couldn't stand it because I want to look after my children. Now I couldn't do anything. I want to look after my children. Who is going to look after my children when I passed away? And he had, she had this intensive thought at the juncture of death that she was reborn in another place. She still thought about it. So you still have memories of past life because at a, ju at a junction of death, if, you're, if your thought is so strong in a certain thing, uh, you're going you're gonna to live with it in your next life too. And then she actually had memories of past lives and she actually went back to that village, Malahide, and uh, researched and researched. I think she, in, in, in the present life, she became a doctor, a very educated woman. And she did a lot of research just trying to find where Malahide is, where the children are, and she finally tracked them down. Of course, now she is much younger than her children. Her children is already range age between 60 and 80, and now she's only, she's only 32. So life is a whole loop of reincarnations. If you're not interested in ending this, since you're living, what are you interested in? Fame, reputation, money, temporary happiness, creating karmic energy, getting the suffering. Our life, it seems to be that our goal is for enlightenment, nothing else. Nothing is meaningful anymore. What's the meaning of getting to an, another breakfast, another lunch, another dinner, another round of night and day and round and day and four seasons and everything, and finally, you died. Is that the meaning of life? The meaning of life is looking for enlightenment, looking for getting away from suffering. All right, that's a sidetrack of what I'm talking about. Consciousness only. How do the Yogacara, how do they perceive enlightenment? how to achieve enlightenment. But getting back to what I talk about or the different schools, let's look at the number of roads that can be taken leading to enlightenment. The 10 schools of Buddhism. The first one is reality school. 
the Kosa school or Apidama school. And the Chinese language is Ju She Lun. Because of Kosa, Kosa is Ju She translated. There's a Kosa Sutra, Abhidharma Kosa Sutra, written by uh, Vasubandhu. Chu uh, She Zhong, Kui Se Zhong. That's one school. Remember, I like you to know about different schools of Buddhism so that you know the categories. The Kosa school, the foundation te the text of this is Abhidharma Kosa Sastra by Vasubandhu. And the Sastra was translated and introduced to China from India by Xuan Zhang Da Si, the monk who traveled to India and studied in India for 17 years. He brought back that Kosa Sastra. The Sastra classifies all phenomena of the cosmos under 75 categories. Shishu Wu Fa, every one of these categories of the Dharma, the, the Sastra study, and a student of this school learns the way of liberating oneself from the passions and mental afflictions and attains subsequent annihilation of suffering. Study the passions first, the emotions first, and then try to eliminate these emotions through meditation. The student bases learning on the Four Noble Truth, the Eightfold Path, Four Noble Truth, suffering, causes of suffering, cessation of suffering, and the, and the, and the Noble Eightfold Path. So this school is nowadays what we call the Theravada school. Uh, or in, in, in a term that usually referred to as Xiao Cheng Fo Fa, the Theravada, the Hinayana school. It was popular in China during the Tang Dynasty, and nowadays it's very popular in, in Burma, in Thailand, in Cambodia, in, in many other countries in Southeast Asia. We call it the Theravada school, the Hinayana, or translate the Hinayana into, into an English meaning means the smaller wheel. There's the big wheel, Da Cheng Fo Fa, and the smaller wheel, Xiao Cheng Fo Fa. The smaller wheel and the big wheel. It does not mean that the smaller wheel is inferior. It's just a car that contains less people. It, it takes you to the same destination, but it contains less people. But the Mahayana is a bigger car that takes you to the destination. Don't discriminate. The Hinayana is inferior, the Mahayana is... Uh, the, the smaller car is not as good as the bigger car, no? It depends on, on, on where you go and how many people are going. Okay, so that is the Kosa school. So that's it for explaining that school, the reality school. The second is Satya Siddhi school, based upon Satya Siddhi Sastra, Chang Shi Lun, by Harivaman, uh, translated into Chinese by Kumarajiva in the 5th century. This school flourished during the 6th dynasty and the Tang dynasty, which is in the 5th and 6th century. It teaches one to look upon the cosmos in realms, the worldly realm and the supreme realm. A student of this school is to meditate on the unreality of self and the unreality of things in order to enter into nirvana. Everything is not substantial, it's not real, but we treat them as real. So this Satya City school examined the cosmos in its unreality and arrived at that reality. And this is difficult to understand because you haven't read the Sastra. You haven't read Satya City Sastra. It's still regarded as the Hinayana. Actually, we shouldn't classify Buddhism into Chinese Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. It's just Buddhism is practiced in that country, we call it Chinese Buddhism. In Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism. In Japan, Japanese Buddhism. We shouldn't discriminate, you know, what country practice what. Buddhism is just one. It's just different roles leading to it. Three, three Sastra school base is tenets on Madhyamaka Sastra, Zhonglun, Divada Sanikaya Sastra, Shermanlun, Madhyamaka Sastra, Divada Sanikaya Sastra, and these two Sastra by Nagarjuna, and the Sata Sastra by Ari Deva. It teaches one to dispose of the eight misleading ideas of 
birth, death, and permanence, identity, difference, coming and going, and establish correct thinking, one will discover the truth through the study and visualization of sunyata, emptiness. So this school, San Lun Zhong, study sunyata, prajna, emptiness, voidness in detail, and through visualization of voidness and this wisdom of voidness, they detach, no attachment to anything, detach from the unreal substance of the world and getting into sunyata through getting rid of all attachments. So that's the three sastra school that belongs to the Mahayana Buddhism or the, uh, the bigger wheel. The fourth is Tian Tai school, which is the lotus school. Why is it called the Tian Tai? Because the founder was Ji Yi, the name of a monk, of a, a high monk in the 6th century, living in Tian Tai Mountain, China. He spent his whole life in studying the Lotus Sutra, Sadatma Puntarika. The chief text is Lotus Sutra. It also emphasized on commentary on Prashna Paramita Sutra, Da Bore Jing, Maha Prashna Nirvana, Da Nia Pan Jing. This school divides each of the ten realms of existence, hell, ghosts, animals, azuras, men, devas, sravakas, patiyaka buddhas, bodhisattvas, and buddhas in ten realms into ten divisions and study them in detail. This school teaches one to visualize these divisions to gain a clear insight into the truth. The gospel of the Buddha is categorized into five periods and a doctrine into eight kinds. So, that's the Ten Tai, Sadama Puntarika, the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra um, is a very important sutra. So there's so much literature, so much treasures in Buddhism, but um, not a tremendous amount of people, number of people would study them because they don't know about it. The Gatlin School, a Van Tamsaka school. And this school was founded by Tu Shun in the Tang Dynasty, the seventh century. The foundation work is Gatlin Sutra, a Van Tam Sutra. It treats Buddhism in five schools. These five are differentiated into ten schools of thought. This particular school is very profound in theory, in philosophy. It's quite abstruse and it's not easy to study. People uh, studying this school, they must be very highly educated to understand the abstruse philosophy behind it. So it's not very popular, but it's still a lot of people studying this school. Oh, that is the Gartland school, the Huayan Zhong. Six is Chan Zhong, Dhyana or Zen, Zen school. Bodhidharma traveled from India to China in the Liang dynasty, established such as Zen school or Chan school in China in the 6th century. This school does not rely on the use of words or concept. It points directly to the mind and see into one's own nature through meditation. After the 6th patriarch, uh, Hui Leng, in the Tang Dynasty, this school expanded into five and later into seven school. It has been very popular over a thousand years. In China. Nowadays, this school is also very popular in many countries. Actually, many, many people in North Americans are studying Zen Buddhism. That's what we're studying. And some people are studying Zen Buddhism in relation to Chan, uh, of the Chinese Chan, uh, which is not depending on words. Uh, they have special, their own practice. And some study meditation in terms of Anapanasati, in terms of the Theravada school of meditation. Uh, that's, we still call that meditation school, the Zen school, broadly speaking. So number six, Chan or Zen, has been a very popular school in North America, all over the world, even nowadays. Seventh, discipline school, Lu Zhong, Vinaya school. And Vinaya school, it's based on monastic rules laid down by the Buddha. The rules of five divisions, 
Theravada and Mahayana have separate sets of monastic rules. These rules are the basic moral code of the Buddha. And Dao Xuan of China promoted the four division, Vinaya, and founded this school in the Tang Dynasty. The essence of this school is to do good and stop all evil deeds. One must follow strictly on the code of ethics so as to free oneself from the ocean of misery and prepare oneself for Buddhahood. So in other words, this discipline school is the study of every sila, every precept in detail. The monks have 250 precepts, the nuns have 348 precepts, and ordinary laymen have the five precepts, the eight precepts. They study the morality as laid down as rules in the Buddhist teaching of the Vinaya. What is the logic or the, the meaning behind this Vinaya school? Uh, maybe we should talk about it for one or two minutes. Why do we need morality? Why do we need code of ethics? Because in our interaction with the outside world, our sense organs interact with outside objects. And in the process of these interactions, we create attachments. And because of attachments, passions, emotions, uh, mental afflictions arise in our mind when we interact. You may not realize it. When your eyes see, when your ears listen, when your nose smell, when your mouth eat, all these senses when you interact with the outside world, actually you are creating feelings, emotions, and passions, and you're being led away by these without noticing them. How do we overcome these passions? For example, passions of jealousy, hatred, disappointment, greediness, depressions, arrogance, self-deceit, egoist, egoist feeling, all these different mental afflictions in us, in us. When we interact with the outside world, these are, this automatically come out and dominate us. Dominate us to such, such a way that we suffer from them. An average individual just responded with emotions. When something really sorrowful comes out, you just cry. You just control yourself. You cannot control yourself. When something uh, wrathful come up, when something that create your hatred comes up, you just feel angry, you want to fight, you want to yell, you want to scold, you want to do all kinds of emotional reactions to it. You just respond it with emotions. Why do you respond with emotions and in the process of emotions you create comic deeds of killing, lying, sexual misconduct and all this? Why do we have that? Because we cannot control ourselves. Our concentration, our wisdom, are not sufficient enough to control all these things. That's why we depend on what? Our philosophy of morality in our mind to control them. We know then stop, do not kill. Stop, do not steal. Stop, do not commit sexual misconduct. Stop, do not lie. So the Buddha knows that it's difficult to use your own internal concentration and wisdom to overcome all these, you need someone to tell you what you should not do. That's the morality. That's at the front door. In other words, you need security guards at the front door because you don't have that wisdom in you to guard yourself. You need security guards. These security guards are the core of ethics. That's the purpose of the discipline school. They're absolutely important. Imagine if monks and nuns are without morality. How can you call them monks and nuns? If the monks do not have 250 precepts, if the nuns do not have those precepts, if they just do what they want to do, there's no Sangha order. If everybody is allowed to kill, to steal, to, to, to commit sexual misconduct, what would become of the society? Even humans themselves create certain code of ethics. Not to say code of ethics, ethics which are so minute, so detailed as created by the Buddha. So the Vinaya school is absolutely important. You see what I mean? So that's the discipline school. And actually the discipline school 
is a school that applies to almost all schools. Imagine if you're in reality school, free sister school, Dartland school, Chan school, if, if you still kill, steal, lie, sexual misconduct, you would not be successful in any schools to take. So that's almost like a must. In other words, that's the gasoline of the cars. If you don't have any gasoline, that's just mad. it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive. Small car, big car, you cannot move it. Or you do not have the lubricant oil in it. That's the lubricants of the vehicle that you take. If you are meditating every day, six hours per day, if you still commit sexual misconduct, you think you'll be successful because, to become enlightened? If you still steal, kill, you're still cruel, you still have emotional emotion and passion, but you meditate for six hours per day, you think you can get enlightened? No. Because you'll be so covered with the karmic energy that you cannot get enlightened. So that school, the discipline school, is like a lubricant for all these different schools. All right, eight, esoteric school. Based on Veritana Sutra, Diamond Apex Sutra, and Susiti Sutra. This school was introduced to China during the Tang Dynasty by Sukha Karas Nureha, uh, Vrajramati, and Amoka. The fundamental concepts are the six elements, the earth, water, fire, air, space, and cognition, thinking and cognition. One is to attain self-realization by the three phenomena of the body, posture and signs, the mouth, the voice, the mind, the meditation. The mystic body is associated with water, earth and fire, the words from the mouth associated with space, wind space, and the mind associated with cognition. It passed to Tibet and is now known as the Tibetan esoteric Buddhism. So that is esoteric school. And uh, the number nine, right? the Yogacara school, Tamala Sana, also known as Yogacara. Uh, so this Tamala Sana is uh, related to consciousness only, the Yogacara school. The foundation works are the Yogacara Bhumi Sastra and which Nana Matrata Siddhi Sastra. This school aims at studying the nature in relation to the phenomena expressions of cosmic existence. It was advocated by Maitreya and succeeded by Asanga Vasubandhu. You know who is Maitreya? When you enter the door, the entrance to the garden, the big belly Buddha, Maitreya. Maitreya, the future Buddha, specialized in the study of consciousness. of the philosophy of consciousness. And uh, it was later succeeded by Asanga, Vasubandhu. And later it was, knowledge was passed down to Silabhatra. Silabhatra is the teacher of Xuanzang, 1,000 years ago. And uh, he was at that time the, uh, the abbot of the Landa Temple Monastery. Lalanda Monastery is now being con converted into Lalanda University. I just talked to Professor uh, Asura Kruchika. They are renovating the whole university at Alanda at, in India. They call it Alanda University. They spent a lot of, they budgeted a lot of money to make that into a world studies of the uh, uh, international Buddhist studies centers, centers. It used to be uh, uh, a school for Yogacara. Yogacara and Dhamma Laksana, uh, they are the same. Yogacara is another word for consciousness only. Yoga is unity and harmony. Chara is to practice it, yoga, to practice harmony. It's the same as consciousness only school. Yogacara is the academic, the academic name for consciousness, consciousness only school. And consciousness only school in the, in, in the Sanskrit language is Vujnana Matrata, consciousness only, Vujnana Matrata. 
In the English meaning, is consciousness only. And why call consciousness only? What's the reason for, for calling it that way? We'll, we'll venture into it in detail later. I'm just giving you the different roles. Right now, t talking about different roles of Buddhism leading to enlightenment. I haven't even started consciousness only. I just give an introduction to it. And uh, nobody, nobody is sleeping or dozing away. That's surprising. I thought this is very boring. Not boring at all? Who find it boring? Raise your hands. Of course, you won't raise your hands. You don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah. Okay. So, 10, Pure Land School, Sugavati School, or Jing Tu Zhong. This is another school. It is based on three sutras. Sugavati Vyoha Sutra. The Great Sugavati Vyoha Sutra. Small Sugavati Vyoha Sutra. This school was established by Hui Yuan Da Si, 4th century. He set up the Lotus Society at Jiangxi province. This organization, this school, greatly incited the enthusiasm of studying Buddhism among the Chinese and succeeded in spreading it to almost every household. It teaches one to set the mind solely on Amitabha, to recite the holy name and to recite the holy name repeatedly and one may gain salvation to the pure land of Amitabha. This school is like setting up uh, a country where you can migrate to, you can emigrate to. In other words, one would not be, if one does not become successful in one's lifetime, in becoming a Buddha, in getting away, uh, getting away from reincarnations, getting away, away from suffering, there is a country that you can go to after death. Your, if I may say it, quote unquote, your soul, you, your soul, we shouldn't say soul, but for the sake of understanding, you would emigrate into that country where you would not retrogress into suffering into reincarnation and in there you became a student of Amitabha. You became his student and became a student of his assistant professors uh, Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva, Samarabhatra Bodhisattva. There are a lot of Bodhisattvas and Arahats and Saints in that country where they were there ready to teach all these people who are willing to immigrate into that country. Because for those who would not be successful in realization in this world, who would be successful in this age where Buddhism is actually degenerating, disintegrating? So that's a salvation school. That is a, a midpoint, there's a point that where you can go to and not get into reincarnation anymore. So the method employed is simply this, it is suited to everybody who has faith in Amitabha and who resolves to be reborn in the Pure Land. So that becomes very popular because that is an easier school to go to. It's just like if you want to go to Ivy League universities, if you want to go to top universities, they would not allow, the, the admissions requirements are extremely strict are you qualified? You've got to have a GPA of 99.5 in order to get in the, into those universities. And now there is another, other, another university, it says, you don't have to get 99.5 as long as you have 60. We're allowed you to go there. But you must get 60. It's easier to come by. It's easier to achieve 60 than 99.5. But 60 is not easy. You have to, your heart, your mind must be related enthusiastically with the mind of Amitabha, Amitabha Buddha. And, all, and, and, and the three sutras and many commentaries help us to understand how to qualify yourself to go there. The, the, the qualifications for achieving at 60% of your GPA to get into that school. Even people who study Zen, they always repeatedly tell their students, if you're not successful in your Zen, 
in your chant meditation but at the verge of dying if you are not still enlightened you must go to the pure land don't reincarnate again you lose your, your identity you lose your identity you get into reincarnation you lose your identity your clear identity of yourself who would be successful in one's lifetime to be a Buddha to be an Arahat to be a, a Strodopana Sacred Garment Anagarment you think you can get rid of all your mental your mental afflictions within one's lifetime very difficult given the, the egoistic attitude that everybody has giving all the karmic energy that overwhelm you given all this depression jealousy hatred how can you achieve Buddhahood so pe most people in China they practice the pure land school to take an easy route as long as you can get to universities who cares which university you can go to first and we used to have a saying people ask what would I do when I get into heaven and the guy says who cares as long as you can go to heaven who cares how what, what would you do you're in heaven already right as long as you go to heaven you still care about what would you what what classification you have whether you become a rich man in heaven or a poor guy in heaven there's no such thing as rich and poor in heaven everybody is rich so why do you still worry about what classifications what level as long as you can go to heaven so the pure land school now these are the schools and we said okay now the principles of all the above schools are based on the partial partial doctrines of Sakyamuni Buddha in the beginning there were no such things as schools in Buddhism the disciples of the Buddha however took up what had been most beneficial and most practical to them for them thus the ten schools have evolved they, they, they gradually evolve into a ten school because everybody has different abilities different education different understandings to have different schools and we shouldn't say this is no good because this is difficult that is easy that is better no some people have better understanding than you so don't criticize the school oh this Zen school is difficult this garden school is difficult you're discriminating he may be okay but the Zen school you may not because in his previous life he could have practiced meditation for a long time that he only would need another life he'll become enlightened so if you just criticize your school you're just discriminating why what why are you discriminating again why I say this is better this is not good everybody has one's abilities knowledge background calm energy everybody is different um, in your family every children is different every child is different you want John to go into Harvard he's not that kind of a fellow he wants to go into a music school where will be an expert in piano why do you force him to be a doctor <laughs> that's, that's your discrimination if he can be a good if he can be a good magician why do you force your son to be a doctor he could do better doing ma magic performance all right so I got this 10 schools communicated to you uh, in simple terms and what we will look at in detail starting from the next lecture is which school can you tell me which school please just remind me this number nine the Yogacara school or Dhamma Laksana school Dhamma Laksana school Laksana school um, and Yogacara school uh, or the consciousness only school why do why do I bring about this because this school is very logical and it studies the consciousness it studies the mentality and it helps you in your practice and I have been very interested in this school since 30 years ago and I spent a lot of time in studying it 
uh, and I think I, I could be in a position that I, could, I feel comfortable in communicating to you what I learned in this school. And, um, and also this school of thought highly increased your, your logistics in communications, your logistics in, in spreading the Dharma. Um, in my mind, if you, if you really know this school of thought, you really can teach the Dharma, spread the Dharma, uh, because it's, it's about logic, about consciousness. Okay, so, uh, now let's get into what is Yogacara. The Yogacara school, consciousness only school, brought Mahayana thought to its full scope and completion. It itself is not a specific meditative practice. It's not a meditative practice. But it provides you an abundance um, understanding, a rich understanding, gives you the tools to apply uh, when you're meditating. Because it, 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 it leads you to the understanding of actions and intentions of all sentient beings and develop a philosophy that facilitates enlightenment. It develops your understanding of the world, your relationship with the world, your relationship with all individuals, and your relationship with cosmos. Consciousness is awareness of a self. And the fundamental doctrine of the Yoga Chara school is that all phenomenal existence is fabricated by consciousness. And consciousness is the basis of all activities from birth to attaining enlightenment. So everything is based on distinctions in the mind. You make distinctions in the mind. Consciousness in making distinctions between self and other becomes the subject which treats everything else as the object. You always think yourself as a subject and all the others as an object. You're creating a discriminative attitude towards you and others. This is me, this is you. I'm the subject, you are just the object. And the consciousness itself is real, but the existence is not real. Your consciousness is real, but everything that exists is not real. It exists as a series of streams of successive momentary awareness of events, each event replaced by consciousnesses in the next moment. So consciousness has no substantiality and is dependent on consciousness of the preceding instant. In other words, consciousness in a flux, a flux and a stream, a moment, momentarily, a momentary uh, successions of events. That's your consciousness. Existence is not real. It's just a whole stream of successive awareness of events. We, we call it the Vichnana. But then we're only explaining consciousness in a broad general terms. What exactly is consciousness? How does consciousness work? How does consciousness come about? Why do we say it in that way? Why do we say that consciousness uh, is real, but the existence of everything is not real? How can you justify in saying that? You gotta study it. You don't argue without studying it. Why do you say that? Consciousness is not real. No, consciousness is real and unreal. Well, before you argue about it, you gotta understand what, what is meant by consciousness. How is a thought created? How our sense organs work when our sense organs interact with the outside world? When we see something, how do we see it? When we listen to sound, how do we listen? Why do we attach to sound? Why do we attach to, to music? Why do we attach to, um, to jazz and not to rap? Uh, why do we attach to uh, uh, pop music and not to classical? Why do we hate criticism? Why do we like compliments. All these consciousness, streams of thoughts, momentary 
succession of streams of thought. How do they work? All this we have to study. That is within the realm of study of the Yogacara. How is everything fit in harmony? How does this harmony work, come about? And how, does we, how do we need everything into harmony, into unity? And if we have that complete, perfect harmony, that's enlightenment. That's a nirvana. That's getting away from suffering. That's getting away from reincarnation. That's getting away from mental afflictions of jealousy, hatred, greed, greediness, you name them. So are people interested in, doing, in, in understanding it? Not, not everybody. We are studying the problems that we have and how do we resolve these problems. And av average people, they just continue with the problem. Because in the process of, of, of attaching to fame, reputation, greediness, they are creating problems for themselves. Whereas we are, as Yogacharas, we study these problems understand these problems and try to get solutions to them. We study these and get a solution for it. But before we get solutions, we have to identify the problems first. If we don't identify the problems, how do you design methods to overcome these problems? If you don't even identify the problem, many people don't even want to identify them. They just carry the problems in their daily lives. They just react with emotions. Problems react with problems. 